1568. For Japan, it was just another year of the Sengoku Jidai, the maelstrom of wars, famine, rebellions and tumult that had raged for 100 years. Countless samurai lords vied for power, hoping to fill the vacuum left by the fall of the Ashikaga Shogunate. But increasingly it was the common people who were pressed into doing the fighting, causing the endless war to seep into the spirit of the whole nation. Thus, the fate of the common people had become tied to the ambitions of bloodthirsty warlords, with life and death always a sword stroke away. But in turn, the fate of the samurai lords had become mixed with the will of the people, and now and again it was a commoner who took the fate of all into their own hands. Many had tried to find a way to end the war, but all had failed. But in 1568, one such remarkable commoner, a young woman from the mercantile city of Hakata, began a journey that would light the beacon of hope brighter than ever before, not that she ever wished it to be so. And her story, like so many of the era, began in a haze of smoke, with the smell of freshly spilt blood strong in the air. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Father! Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Why have you done this? Young Naruko of Hakata had, in the blink of an eye and the lick of a flame, found herself joining the ranks of those orphaned by the chaos. With a mother she never knew, and a father murdered by the as yet unexplained attack, she was alone in a world that preyed on the weak. But luckily for Japan, Nariko was far from weak. She knew that whoever these men were who attacked her father's famous blacksmith, they could very easily be out to kill her too. Not stopping to grieve for her loss, she bartered what tools she had salvaged from the blaze for a horse. She left the town that had been her world before the flames devouring her home of 18 years had even subsided. There was only one other place in all Kyushu, all Japan in fact, where Nariko could find someone she could trust. And even then, the trust was simply blind faith. She departed as fast as she could, riding south, alone and without the delay of baggage but for a sword she barely knew how to use. The man she was riding to see, however, knew much of the sword, bow, spear and polearm. His name was Master Ujie, a lifelong patron of her father's work at the forge, and the only man of honour Nariko could rely on. She had never once spoken to this man, she had only on a few occasions glimpsed his face. Let the fact she turned to this man for help in her darkest hour be a testament to the desperation and hopelessness of this young girl. A few days after the events at Hakata, Master Ujie found himself beckoned out of his remote training compound to meet a rider approaching at full gallop. What is the matter, traveller? Master, Master, I am sorry. Sorry, but I do not understand. Please take a breath and present yourself. Ujie sensei my name is Nariko. Do you remember Matsunaga, the smith of Hakata? Well, of course, his steel lines my walls. Does he have something he wishes to... Wait, no, I must apologize, Naruko Dano. I have rushed into things. The daughter of Matsunaga Masanori stands before me, and I waffle like an old fool. But before I offer you refreshment, it seems there's something you wish to say. Uh, father is dead. Saying nothing else, Master Ujie took Naruko inside his humble martial arts school, offering her all she needed after the long and hasty journey. He agreed to meet with her again the following morning to listen to all Nariko had and needed to say. Terrible, terrible. These men are untrained minds, unpredictable, uncivilized. Such a thing is not uncommon, but that it should happen to Matsunaga and to you is... Well, the fortunes of this land have been dull as long as I remember, but I had never thought such good people could... Oh, listen to me. You did not come here to be told how unfortunate you are. It's okay, Ujie sensei You're right. I should not feel sad when this happens to so many. Do not deny the feeling, but do not let it warp you. You will have many feelings on this matter for the rest of your life. They will drive you to think and do many things if you let them. It is best to sit back in your mind and simply let the feelings run their course without you. 
I will try, Sensei. And there is something. Something I will tell you that might make you feel differently. Whether it will be better or worse, well, I will just say it. The fact is, I believe I may be able to tell you what those men were doing. Why they attacked your home. Then tell me, Sensei. Your father has long held something quite valuable in his possession. I gather he never spoke of it to you. For your own good, no doubt. It was a treasure, a possession once held by the late Emperor himself. Before he ever had you, he was smithing in the Imperial Palace. Quite the honour, or at least it used to be. When the wars began and the Emperor saw his days were numbered, many of his most precious treasures were smuggled away by inconspicuous means. Your father was one of those tasked with protecting such a treasure. He had intended to travel to Tanigashima, but, well, there was trouble at the docks in Funai, trouble I bore witness to myself. Sailors wanted to know what the carts he was travelling with were carrying, insisted at sword point to know, and your father insisted just as hard that no one had a right to know. I think if I hadn't intervened, your father would have lost in the end. I convinced the sailors to leave and your father to come with me. Did you see what the treasure was? No, I never did. I simply saw that your father had reasons of his own to keep it hidden and inquired no further. When I learned he was a smith, I sent him on to Hakata to join the guild I was familiar with in the city. We met countless times after that, as you know of course, but he never once mentioned that cart or its payload. So the bandits knew he had the treasure and took it. Is that all this was? If they had learned of the treasure, an imperial treasure no less, that would fully explain their barbarity in their attempts to find it. And with your father now gone, they must have found it. They wouldn't have... they wouldn't have done that if he hadn't already told them where it was. Or perhaps they did it because he refused to tell them. Their small minds might not have realized the folly in it. But they burned the blacksmith. They wouldn't risk destroying the treasure. They must have found it first. You might be right. But whether they have the treasure or not isn't important. Imperial trinkets mean less every passing day. Whatever they took, I want it back. I cannot bring father back. But I can still protect his honor by restoring the treasure to the Emperor. <laughs> So bold and noble a thing I have not heard in a long time. Will you help me? Well, I shall have to think on it. If you want to track the treasure down, you will have to place yourself in great danger. Not something anyone should do lightly. But if you are resolved, then perhaps fortune offers you a respite. You find yourself at a dojo of martial arts. I shall teach you many things that may well save your life. And things to end the lives of others. Yes, that too, but you will hopefully learn that to end the life of another is nothing near the triviality of wishing it, and is always something one regrets. Greater than the regret of doing nothing? Perhaps not. This is not the time for such a discussion anyway, and perhaps I am not the man to have it with. What I can do is teach you how to use that sword you've brought. And so, Nariko found herself a new home, a new guardian, and a new profession. No longer would she create swords, now she would wield them. To restore the treasure she was by right responsible for as the only heir of its former master, she would have to start from the very bottom. Shocked, battered and exhausted, but getting stronger every day. So welcome ladies and gentlemen to Nariko's Treasure, my Mountain Blade Gekukujo mod narrative let's play where I'll be guiding Nariko and you through a journey through ancient Japan. We're starting off that journey here in Master Ujie's training school where to start the game we're going to go through a small quest that he has to offer where we have to fight with a series of training opponents in order to build up our basic skills and this will give us enough experience to get up the first couple of levels making the start of the game a tiny bit easier. So basically you have to fight three opponents from each tier that he has to offer. And you can see if you're not familiar with Mountain Blade that its core combat system is based on a series of four possible attacks, up, left, right and down and equivalent blocking moves, although in my case I've got it on the automatic block direction setting so if you press block it will block in the relevant direction to the nearest attack that's coming at you, although you can't block in all directions at once of course. So basically what you have to do is read your opponent's moves, try and memorize how long attacks take and know how fast weapons are and improve your proficiency as a character using weapons 
so that you can attack faster and do more damage. It's a little bit chaotic, but I'm already fairly experienced at it, which gives Naruko a little bit of a meta boost here in the game, because we're able to get through this training exercise quite easily, taking down even the high-end opponents here by just cutting them to pieces with these wooden swords. So we've been gaining experience and gaining weapon proficiency the whole time, which is great, and you get bonus experience for reaching the end of the training regime. So at the end of that, we're now technically a little bit more ready to start our adventure, but we're not actually quite ready because of Naruko's starting build setup. So let's take a look at that. We're level two right now, and you can see in the bottom left, the four main attributes of a character, strength, agility, intelligence, and charisma. Naruko focusing on intelligence with low agility and strength, leveling up the strength to eight there. You need a strength rating of nine to be able to wield a sword, which is an important milestone. So all this training doesn't actually add up to much because we can't can't use any weapons out in the wild, we can only use wooden training weapons which don't have requirements. In the middle here we can see all of the detailed skills. We've got a lot of skills that are focusing on leading forces, not many skills focusing on personal ability or combat, and that's what we really want to build for a character in Mountain Blade who's going to go on a very wide ranging adventure because we're going to need to manage lots of people along the way. I'm also going to throw my spare weapon points into pole arms since we're going to use those a fair bit. Now there's lots of other training available at Master Ujie's school. One such exercise you can do is spar sparring, sorry, where you spar with other students at the school. And right now there are three other villagers here. Of course, technically in the game's logic, for those who know the game, I brought these here myself. They are in my party, so I've brought them in, but in our narrative they are simply students at the school. And you have to fight them in these little sparring matches where you actually have to fight them all at the same time, if you wish, for bonus experience. So you can see what I'm doing is the primary technique for fighting multiple opponents in melee, which is trying to make them queue behind each other so that you're fighting a series of one-on-ones because it's almost impossible to win against two or more opponents at once. It's quite a realistic system in terms of how the combat works. So you can see everyone involved in that fight gets experience, and because those villagers are in my party, them gaining experience allows me to pay for them to level up and give them superior equipment. So here they are in my party, the villagers from Satsuma, Satsuma just being the name of the region of Japan that we're in. So I can upgrade two of them to be spearmen and one to be a skirmisher. This increases my weekly cost because I'm paying them to be in my party and I had to pay a little bonus for their equipment upgrades. But that's a nice little start to the game. It's good to have a couple of real soldiers with you as you travel around because the really low level hostile parties you might encounter like looters or bandits can take you down if you don't have a basic amount of protection. So I'm going to continue on and do some more sparring with these guys both in order to train them up and because I want myself to get to at least level 3 before we move out and start going into the wider world and that's easy enough. As well as that sparring, there are other kinds of training we can do as well. Here you can see those three uh, soldiers who we now have in our party watching me doing this training. This is Lancer training, basically. You don't really gain much experience as a character from doing this, but as a player, it's quite good to be able to get used to traversing these obstacle courses whilst using a horseback weapon. Naruko has a merchant background, which allows her to ride horses from the beginning of the game, which is extremely useful. She's not very good with pole arms, and doing this doesn't actually make the character any better as I said it's just making you as the player better so after a while of going through the optical course and taking out targets with a practice lance we get a tiny bit of experience but not very efficient in terms of a way to actually level up your character so we don't need to do much more of that there's also ranged weapon practice which is pretty much useless and is a slightly broken in this mod actually so I'm not going to try and do that so now a little bit later on you can see my party is leveled up even more we've got some veteran and trained troops among us I've achieved level 3, and it's time to apply my level up, and I actually put it into Charisma, thinking I want to level up Leadership, instead of getting that level 9 strength allowing me to use swords. Now, Leadership is very useful because it gives you cheaper parties and the ability to have larger parties, but I didn't realise how much of a mistake it would be to not actually have the ability to use swords, and we're about to find out why. So here we are at night one day, sparring a little bit more, just training a little bit before we move out, and we get this special event. I was scouting outside 
inside the school and come across these guys hanging around. And we decide to go and find out what's going on. Turns out there's a bit of a problem though. These guys are hostile towards me. It's an agent and some troops, up to no good, no doubt. Some hired troops following the agent, I guess. And because we are unable to use a sword, we are now stuck out here equipped with only a kunai, which is a tiny dagger-like weapon which is unable to do blocking moves, meaning the enemy can just hit me and I literally can't stop them from doing it other than backing away up this hill, which is giving me a little bit of an advantage. It's hard to hit uphill, and I'm even able to hit down at them by making very quick strikes, but they're barely doing any damage, so very unlikely to get out of this alive, and there we go. They make a blow. I'm knocked to the ground, but luckily it tells me they do leave me alive. Ah, there you are. Your rescuer's wager would be waiting until dawn for you to wake up. I'm so sorry, Master. True or not, no use saying it. I already spoke with the other students. You went off on your own, despite their recommendation, and you have paid the price for your overconfidence. I thought they might be coming to the school. I just... I wanted to... The difference between what you wanted to do and what you can do is no small part of honor, Naruko-chan. Admirable intentions do nothing to mask foolish execution. You were lucky to come away so lightly. No blood? I wore my smithing apron. <laughs> Improvisation. At least that is a quality of a fine warrior. Naruko, you would do well to stay and train with us properly. What trail to the bandits would be left after years in the mountains? I need to get out there, and you need to survive. The line that passes through these two rests is thin indeed. I know I cannot stop you leaving, so... I'll tell you what I would do in your shoes. Go to Kagoshima. I can tell you the way. The city is vast, safe, but full of travellers who might be able to provide you with clues. At the very least, there's plenty of work there, and coin will turn your investigation from mud to water. Some of the seasonal students will want to go with you if you can find them work. You are too forgiving, Ujie-sensei. No, it is only that you are particularly worthy of forgiveness. Now, enough of this. Let's focus on getting you up and running again. In order to restore health in the game, you have to wait and rest around. Now, by the next morning, we're actually back to full health, which actually makes me think we didn't lose any health from that event, because that seems unusually quick. But, oh well, at full health, that means we can continue with our work. So we're going to follow the advice of Master Ujie and head west to Kagoshima, a city nearby. Cities provide all sorts of services, especially to adventurers like us. So we're going to head over there. It's going to take a while to walk, but we are on horseback, which increases the movement speed of the party, even if it has members who aren't on horseback in it because that's just how the game works so we can get there pretty fast. So when we arrive we are going to take a walk in the streets to take a look at Kagoshima, the capital of the Shimazu clan's domain and a very safe part of the map that very rarely sees any war because it's in such a nestled away part of Japan. Now the first thing we need to do in the town is talk to the guildmaster. The guildmaster allows you to take on manual labor jobs or work around town for the guild for which you are paid and your party members will get involved with you and their work will contribute to the amount of money you get as well. So we can make 8 mon per shift, which is 8 hours, which is okay, not very much, but right at the start of the game these scraps of money will come in very handy. The next thing to investigate is the practice arena, the city's arena for warriors who don't have anything to do, essentially, where they practice fighting each other using wooden weapons, just like at the training school. We learn that sometimes tournaments are held here, but there aren't any tournaments going on right now or any time soon, but what we can do is just jump into the free-for-all arena where we're allowed to fight against anyone and everyone coming in to fight against us. At first it's just a massive brawl because the first few people who come into the arena all fight at once in an all against all match which is very deadly and we don't come out on top as you can see. However there is no penalty for being defeated in the practice arena. It is only practice. Your health is restored every time you lose but you still get bits of experience and weapon proficiency for fighting. So over time this can make your character better when you're not really strong enough to be fighting actual opponents and risking the actual uh, loss of battle. As we're fighting here, you can see there's an opponent's beaten count in the top left. Now, as this count goes up, you go over certain tiers, which means at the end of the practice fight, you will get a bonus amount of experience and a cash reward based on what tier you reached. Now, I think the first tier is to beat two opponents, and the next one is to beat six, if I recall correctly, but there's all sorts of levels you can reach, and you get an absolutely massive cash reward if you reach the end of the entire training session, which is very difficult because it gets harder and harder 
and more and more opponents come at you in the final stages. So right now, we're doing okay in this fight, but not well enough. This archer is going to cut us down with a little wooden dagger there. But we beat six opponents, and as I said, that's enough to qualify for a reward. So there we go, we get 10 experience and 10 mon, which isn't all that bad, considering that's the amount we get for doing an entire day's work as well. So as well as pulling shifts in the city, there's another way for us to make money in these early phases of the game. We can head with our working party to some of the nearby villages servicing the city and look for work there as well. Working in the village is a slightly different kind of task because it lasts for three days rather than just one shift and they don't pay you in money because usually they don't have any money to pay you with, they pay you in food and as we saw just there I have to pay my party even while they're working for me like this so we've only actually got a couple of weeks worth of money in reserve in order to keep the party together but the money we're going to make by doing tasks like this should make up for it. So eventually we finish working for these villagers after three days, it also improves the villagers' opinion of us, which right now isn't so important, but if you want to be a high fly in Japan, you do need to get the people to like you, but I'm sure that'll come in much later on. So they gave us some vegetables in reward for doing that work for them, and what we can now do is head over to the city and sell the vegetables for money to convert that into mon. It's worth 28, which is a decent number of shifts in the city. Overall, hard to say which one's more time efficient for making money, probably just doing shifts of regular work is the best way to do it. So for several days I basically switched between doing shifts of work and going to the arena to train, but one day the shift ended at night and I couldn't go into the arena because it was closed. I decided to try and go to the inn instead, however we're ambushed by bandits on the way. With only our Kunai to defend ourselves we haven't leveled up yet so we can't use the sword. Luckily the first bandit didn't really attack so we just cut him down with the Kunai. Another bandit comes in and swings far too early, his second blow only glances but now we're in really close, we can hit fast and hard with the Kunai and they're able to bring him down before he can make another attack with his sword. We take a hundred mon from the bodies of these bandits so that's actually quite the haul and a reminder of why we need to keep training. It's her again. She comes in almost every day. She's from a work party. Some of the others were here a few days ago watching her go at it. They're from Master Ujie. Master who? Ujie, the sword master. Haven't heard of him. And I've met all the masters working for Lord Shimazu. He does his own thing, I believe. But clearly he imparted some skill onto this woman. Hmm, a rough sort of skill. Just enough to make you think you have a chance. Everyone here has killed at least one commoner like that. Well, for a commoner and a woman no less, she's giving the local ruffians a hard time. Then make it a fair fight. Give the ruffians the training of a swordmaster as well. You don't like her, I gather. Why should I? No reason, I suppose. But if she comes to the next tournament, well, I'll put a few down on her. The odds will make it worth it. All the training eventually pays off and I reach level 4. So now I can finally get that strength upgrade, which now completes my physical training, allowing me to use the katana, one of the most important weapons in the game, of course, and probably enough of a decent weapon to last right through the entire campaign. There's no real reason to upgrade strength further. There are better weapons you can get at higher levels, but we don't really necessarily need them. So I put my point into inventory management, a very generic skill that just lets you hold more things as you travel around. And now, with that training over, I decided it's time to actually go out and start our investigation. We're going to try and hunt down the bandits. Somewhere in western Kyushu, there's a bandit lair, and we need to discover its location in order to effectively either raid or steal from it to see if they have Nariko's treasure. On the way we meet some ronin who aren't hostile to us, but the deserters that they are running from are hostile, so we need to be careful. Those deserter bands can be very powerful, sometimes even better than bandits because they're usually trained soldiers who are just on the run. We can stick close though to this Shimazu clan army which is moving nearby and that will scare away any hostile parties from us, allowing us to travel safely. And I eventually discover one small band of pirates up here near Kumamoto, but nothing else really, nothing to indicate that their base might be anywhere nearby. But seeing how big that band of pirates was, I realised I am going to need more 
of a presence, have more people in my party in order to contend with any possible conflicts that may occur. So I managed to get one volunteer from the village of Aso to join my bandit tracking party. And as I was heading west, I discovered this Ronin again fighting with some looters. And I decided let's go in and help them out. The looters may have some information on us. And of course, it is always nice to fight for the cause of justice. So as we arrive at the scene of this scuffle, the Ronin actually decide to follow me. They're willing to do whatever I say, which is quite nice of them. I didn't expect them to join my party like this. So now we have a nice band of men ready to rush across this field towards the looters. We know there were only six looters, so we definitely have a numerical advantage, although right now I can't see them at all. I want the battle to take place away from the river. We don't want to be bogged down uh, by having to fight uphill or anything nearby the river. So I'm going to come up this hill right here, both to give us the high ground and to use as a vantage point. And I actually spot the looters over there. I'm going to order my men to form up in this position and now wait for the looters to arrive because they're running right at us. And it was at this moment that I realized I had forgot to equip the sword. It's still left in the baggage. So I have to rush back to our little baggage stash back here where we first started, where I can pull the sword out of the bag and put it into my arms. So now we are ready to fight and I need to rush back to the site of the battle. Luckily for me, the looters actually followed me when I rode away so they didn't interfere with my line. And now it's time for a deadly attack. As a cavalry unit effectively, we are able to do massive damage because the momentum of the horse translates into the momentum of your weapons when you hit enemies, giving you a huge bonus to your attack damage and you'll see in the bottom left if you watch carefully it says speed bonus sometimes when you hit an enemy and that's what that's represented by. So now the chaos begins I order everyone to charge against the looters and now it's an open melee we're just going to ride backwards and forwards trying to avoid taking damage from the looters while distracting them so that our troops on the ground can hunt them down and very shortly all of the looters are taken down so we killed several of them ourselves actually not a bad fight for our little band of warriors but unfortunately we learned that in that chaos the villain who had just volunteered to join our party at ASO was actually killed by the looters in that little scuffle. All of the looters but one killed and the one is going to come with us as a prisoner now thanks to me earlier leveling up that prisoner management skill. We also take some loot from the enemy's corpses which we can put into our inventory and take on to sell at a nearby town to make some money off this whole affair. Overall, a little bit sobering to lose that villager right away, but at least there'll be some consolation as we arrive here to Kumamoto, another Shimazu city, where we can pass off that prisoner we took to a slave dealer who'll give us some money in exchange. And we can also go to the merchants and hand over their clothes and general regalia in order to make a little bit of money as well. Nothing special there, nothing really worth going after in the future at all. So after that, I decided that really we can't justify fighting with pure villagers. We can't just recruit people into our party and then lead them into battle just like that. My new plan was to gather up a band of people who were willing to hunt down the bandits and try and secure some more safety for the people of West Kyushu but they were going to come with me first to go and be trained by Master Ujie so we had a competent band that wouldn't be putting their lives in so much danger. So first I was going to head back to Kagoshima on the way back to Ujie's training school. Unfortunately I was accosted by those skirmishers who I dodged earlier. Luckily for me, really luckily in fact, they are willing to allow me to pay to simply have them move on by. If we had to fight them, that probably would not have been a very pretty fight. We would have been wiped out. So we've once again just about dodged death as we continue on our journey towards Kagoshima and eventually the training school. We've got a long way to go before both us and our party are ready to take on this bandit-ridden world. Naruko had tasted the world of the Sengoku Jidai, a world where every moment not spent fighting was spent preparing to fight, a world where a violent death was no more surprising than a misty dawn. But she had already proven herself worthy to walk the path of a warrior. Brandishing the sword made of her own steel, she had entered the den of wolves and emerged victorious. Her cause earned the sympathy of many followers, but her honest determination to right a wrong brought yet more. Naruko became the centre of a band of ambitious travellers, all seeking to prove to the world they had what it takes to defend what meagre lives the common people still had. It was a forgotten seed from which something unusual might suddenly grow.
Thank you so much for watching the first episode of Narako's Treasure. There's plenty more to come, so please subscribe to keep up to date with the future episodes or check the description for a playlist of any episodes that have been released already. Next time we'll be seeing Narako meeting her first new travelling companion who she's willing to actually tell why she's going after the bandits. So I hope you'll join me for that next time on Narako's Treasure.